Elliot Alderson is back, and alive, thankfully, with a new attitude looking to correct the wrongs he and F Society have wrought upon the world. But with the Dark Army on one side and the FBI on the other, trust is something difficult to come by, especially regarding those closest to him. It's the season premiere of Mr. Robot, episode 3.0, Power Saver Mode, dot H. Hey everyone, D here, and welcome to this week's review of the return of Mr. Robot. So yes, there are spoilers ahead, lots of them. All right, so really excited uh, for the return of this show. You know, it's been a little more than a year since season two uh, really ended, just over a year. And so you're always wondering, you know, are they going to come back and you know, have the same magic, the same sort of feel for the show? And really uh, was not disappointed. Jumping right back in the first scenes, really it was like coming home jumping back into Elliot's world and dealing with the sort of chaos of his last little encounter with Tyrell, which left him with several bullets uh, in his abdomen. So, we pick things up about a week later. He has been out uh, uh, recovering in that time in Angela's apartment. Well, they say he's only been in Angela's apartment for about a day, so probably in the hospital that first week recovering well. An e hospital, well, Dark Army Hospital, really. Not e in that sense. Um, so, he is back, and, you know, we, we've got Elliot re-examining his world. In some ways, there was a, a great interview with Rami Malek, uh, previous uh, to the season opener here, where he was talking about Elliot's sort of path this season. That, in a way, this is Elliot maturing, seeing the, the effects of his actions and, and starting to take responsibility for it. And that's sort of the difference. I mean, last, uh, last season we did have Elliot working to stop phase two, to get in. You know, he, he was feeling that those, had, those decisions had gone too far. But with this episode, and we really catch that in that wonderful rant of his wandering down the street, which is always a perfect Mr. Robot thing, we really have Elliot here taking responsibility for his actions, seeing that his attitude towards life, fuck society, really ended up leading to him fucking society over, uh, opening the door up so Ecor and, and the rest of the power figures could sweep in and take advantage of it. He's not seeing his actions so much as a revolution, as a, a suppression tool, that he opened the door uh, to... Uh, for these corporations to come and press people down, suppress, uh, suppress them, and sort of more make everything even even more so. Really, the capitalization uh, of of fear and stress and concern and and all of that. So this is really a big arc that we're probably going to be following with Elliot all season here, as he really starts to look at the effects of what he has done and start to actively try to rectify them. Now, as with all Mr. Robot episode titles, we have a little file name at the end here. This one, .h, uh, deals with a header file. It is basically a directive that allows to import, change, or, or copy information from one file onto an original file. It's basically used when you're doing layouts of programs. It sort of gives a structure to them, a referral back point. Uh, and it's really interesting that they use that for this episode because it's exactly what Elliot's sort of approach was during the hack down in the hacker bar there, is he was getting them to change some of the core values of which the program builds itself upon. He's like, stop trying to, to, to mess with the program and the effects itself. Alter those values inside the core program so when it reboots the changes that you made, it is now incorporating into its own program. And that is very much also what Elliot is doing with those, uh, those changes of self in this episode. He is taking new information, new values, new data, and replacing his original file for it. Um, so that's, again, like we were talking about with him changing things and, and, and having this new woke attitude. This is really that sort of programming directive part on his side, is he is looking to 
take all of this information of what he has done, change that, and therefore change his actions of what he's going to be doing now. Uh, specifically, instead of trying to screw over society, push society away, he is now starting to embrace. He is changing those core values within himself to now, when he re-engages out of power saver mode, uh, to be a force for, for society as opposed to against it. Now, the, one of the major themes of this particular episode, of course, was the idea of power. And we're not just talking, of course, the power and electricity that's running the lights and everything. We are talking the power over this situation, power over lives, power over the decisions that are being made. Uh, and with power, of course, we are looking at control, control, power, very much two sides of the same coin. And this sort of reiterates, when the power is out, as soon as Elliot gets shot, this is sort of symbolic of him being out. He is out of power, whether it be him or Mr. Robot. Both of the forces that we have, Ecor and, uh, and, and White Rose and, and, and the Dark Army, all of them are using Elliot to one extent or the other. I mean, whether it be uh, 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 Philip Price's move in controlling on Ecor, or of course White Rose's kind of whole secret plan of what's going on, which I'm excited we get to kind of dive into a little bit here. The idea of power and control really continues uh, uh, throughout this episode. So when Elliot wakes up, you know, his first idea, as he even mentions, I am back in control. Uh, until, of course, he realizes that Tyrell Wellick uh, did shoot him, thus is real, and as he says, and his control immediately slips away. So the darkness throughout this episode is really, again, I think those, those, those uh, competitions for power over the situation. Elliot, of course, looking to try and correct the things that he had done. Uh, but, of course, we also have those closest to him. Specifically, we have Angela, who is somebody that thinks that he can trust. But he can't because, of course, Angela is secretly working for White Rose and the Dark Army, carefully maneuvering him around to do what needs to be done. And I love how Angela's kind of really stepped into that role in this episode. Uh, certainly willing to make threats. Hey, you can't do that. Don't call the cops. Or they'll, they'll kill me. They made that clear. Uh, to even after that, manipulating Elliot to spend the night to look out for him to kind of sucker him in uh, from that emotional appeal because, of course, Elliot you know, has a thing for her, for sure. Um, just in order to, to allow Mr. Robot to then come out at, at night. And in fact, the whole Mr. Robot thing I thought was really interesting this episode, considering we didn't see him for most of it. Really get the idea that perhaps Elliot has made a breakthrough in some sense. Has he repressed that part of himself? Uh, but no, that is another control power issue that is definitely in flux. Then we have Darlene on the other side of it and her connection in with the FBI. Uh, because as we saw at the end of last season, she got pulled in. She was being shown the whiteboard and everything and all the connections. So now, six days later, are we really going to believe that she has just been let go after questioning? No. We know that the FBI is following. That was part of the whole super cool car bit. I love that. Um, but even all those words, you're wondering, is she wired? Because she is constantly asking those questions. Who behind it? Was Tyrell behind it? What are you doing? There's all of these questions. If you listen to all that dialogue, it is very much like what you would expect the FBI to want her to ask. Get him to admit these specifics. So we haven't seen our, our dear FBI friend, but I'm sure that, that, is, that we will meet up with her again quite soon. So we've got Darlene, who is looking to be helpful, to looking to, to, to want to support Elliot's decisions, and yet is in a way setting him up uh, for the FBI. And then we have Angela, who is also pretending to be a friend, helping to, to, to support him in what he needs to do, and in the meantime, only manipulating him to the point where she can allow Mr. Robot to come back out uh, and do his thing. So the fun part with that, of course, is by the episode's end, when the power comes back on, this is sort of seemingly a reestablishment of, is it Mr.? I would say that it's Mr. Robot's goal here, because we did see the first thing that when he got back and met back up with Tyrell, and that one fun little back and forth with them, too. I love Mr. Robot fucking with Tyrell. It 
was just beautiful. Um, but the first thing he does is jump into Ecor's power supply, power uh, generators. And it's shortly after that that the power comes back on. So while that is Mr. Robot setting himself up, burrowing back into finding another back door into Evil Core, at some point by the end of the episode, where Elliot's thinking that things are going one direction, but we can actually see uh, that all forces are pushing and manipulating him uh, to do White Rose's bidding. We get to see where the real power lays. White Rose, of course in an E-Core power facility, so that's eh, quite appropriate. All right, now we do have a new player in the game uh, on Dark Army's side, uh, whose name we don't know yet, uh, but he does like to leave cards for uh, Irving's Auto Center on people's dashboards. So I'm assuming that his cover is that of a used car spillsman, which would be perfect. Anyway, the actor playing him is Bobby Carnival, and I've got to say, I love the character. His manner of speech, his straightforwardness, that, that, that permanently affixed little Bluetooth to his ear and the, uh-huh, yep, it was just awesome. Even the whole opening bit in our infamous red wheelbarrow uh, was a beautiful scene, perfectly establishing character, also letting us know that milkshakes here, really, really expensive. $12.95 for a milkshake? Uh, anyway, and it does give our little connection to Red Wheelbarrow, which was the menu upon which Mr. Robot's code was written, which eventually is what led Elliot uh, uh, to Tyrell last season. Uh, also was written in on his notebook, and also I believe is what he burned the notebook in was a Red Wheelbarrow. So it's one of those recurring themes. How much, you know, what exactly that plays in, we don't know yet. Um, but... Like uh, Elliot says, it is probably a Dark Army front, or at the very least, it is closely connected to their little underground facility. So I'm sure we'll see a little bit more of the barbecue place uh, coming forward. And Barbie Carnival's character. God, I love that guy. All right, and lastly, uh, we do have a final bit of insight of what actually is White Rose's plan, as we got to see in the very beginning of the episode in that flash into the E-Core power plant, nuclear power plant, uh, what looks like a giant particle accelerator. Very much reminded me of CERN. Uh, but we did have the other uh, nuclear physicist on tour giving that little discussion about parallel universes. And later on, of course, we have uh, Darlene's discussion, or uh, uh, Angela's discussion about getting back at ECOR, that really what all that she has wanted has been justice. But how do you get justice against a giant faceless conglomerate? Time travel, apparently. Uh, that seems to be what we are pushing for. Time is a big thing in White Rose's uh, point of view. You know, everything is time down to the second. Clocks were all over her place back when we saw in, in China. So the idea of time travel and time manipulation, I mean, it starts to move this from the, the, the science intrigue to the science fiction realm, uh, for sure, for this show. Uh, but... Really, it gives us some really interesting insights into what's going on and also into Elliot's father, who apparently was a big engineer and allowed them some big breakthroughs before uh, he caught cancer and died. Now, I'm wondering, with the big discussion of how important White Rose has said last year about how much the Washington Township plant is important, if this is Ecor's plant at Washington Township and this is why they need it protected and set out how it is because this is White Rose's secret time travel testing facility. Something like that. That seems to be where they're implying it and certainly what uh, Angel believes for because her idea is if they can succeed in this move against Ecor, that they can actually go back in time and right all of the wrongs that Ecor has done. And that's how you get justice against a giant faceless conglomerate. Of course, White Rose pretty much set out that as soon as they succeed, he's got no problem killing Elliot, and I'm assuming Angela and everyone else too, so mm, not really sure about actually getting that justice. All right, and last, just a couple of small things. Uh, one, I love the interaction between Angela and Mr. Robot when he returns. Uh, I mean, all of their dialogue kind of back and forth, very powerful. There's a lot of emotion, there's a lot of intensity to it. Uh, but specifically, I loved when uh, Mr. Robot asks uh, Angela, how can you tell the difference? And of course, her response is, you don't try to look away. 
because Elliot is somewhat autistic in his approach towards things, and definitely very antisocial. He doesn't like to maintain eye contact, which we see all the time. He's always looking around. So I love that as kind of a character bit to really show the difference between Elliot, who is uncomfortable around people, society, and kind of even his goals and approach towards life, versus Mr. Robot, who is dedicated, pure, confident in himself, and unwavering in his approach towards things. So really, I think it's a great physical uh, representation of the difference between two people living in the same body. Anybody else think that uh, Elliot's manager looks like George R.R. R. Martin? Is that what he's been doing this whole time? He should get back to writing. I love the hacker club, especially the kind of idea that while well, the city's in darkness and plunging into chaos, that your elite hackers are basically underground playing games, competing with Capture the Flag to prove who's better. I just, I just thought this was a great move. Also, the mute button that Elliot used. How do I get myself one of those? Uh, using the OnStar capacity to shut down the pursuing FBI vehicle. Beautiful. Also, the fact that Elliot already had noticed and memorized the license plate uh, before he was even asked to do so, that's pure Elliot right there. All right, and lastly, uh, just one little note. You know, I like to do a lot of reviews on superhero movies, all the Marvel stuff, all the Walking Dead, things that take a lot of makeup, a lot of special effects. And one thing that watching this really made a note to me personally was how little budget you actually see. Uh, yes, you have great stars and yes, you have roads that have to be tied up and made to look like, you know, powers out and everything like that. But from an effects standpoint, from real complications, there isn't a huge budget that you see in this film and this show. What drives everything is the incredible writing and the storyline and the, the, the commitment from the actors and, and the whole vision of what is being presented to us. That vision is crystal clear in the people that make it. And it's just, it, it's a great commentary to show how just vision and writing can really propel the strength of a show versus uh, special effects and fanciness. All right, so I think that pretty much covers everything. I mean, a lot happened this episode. I could spend a lot of time talking about each individual points, but I think we're just going to try and hit on some of the main themes that go on because this show is so dense. Uh, and otherwise, it'd be up here talking for an hour. So, really excited that this show is back. Really glad to see it. Cannot wait to see how things are going to develop, and of course the real question, which after uh, seasons one and two is, how much of what we are seeing is real? Where is the faint? Is, is this all happening in Elliot's mind? Is he still unconscious? I mean, we don't know. They have done, you know, the show is very good at having little sneaky things in it. So keep your eyes open. If you guys see anything that I have missed, please let me know. I'd be more than happy to dive back into things, uh, but hopefully I won't be as fooled as I was last season. So very excited about everything coming forward. Hope you are too. So if you did enjoy this review, why don't you go ahead and hit that like button? Thoughts, ideas, and comments, you know where to put them down in the section below. What did you think about this episode? Where do you think we are going this season? And what little trickery is being played on us? Go ahead and let me know what your thoughts are. Now, you can always catch me on Twitter and Instagram. I am at Darren Jakes. Now, this is a big kickoff for our fall finale. We'd already started with Inhumans. We've got this going on. We've got Dirk gently starting up on Saturday night. So excited for that one. And of course, the return of The Walking Dead on the 22nd with its 100th episode. Plus, super excited, Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. returns Friday, December 1st, two-hour premiere. Cannot wait for that, especially because Inhumans suck. So, don't miss any of those reviews. If you are a subscriber, do that by clicking my face right here, and I will throw up an Inhumans review. You can check that out. And a Fear the Walking Dead review. Ooh, exciting stuff. Anyway, check those out. Let me know what you think. That's it for me. I'm D, and I'm out of here. Catch you guys next time. Bye-bye.